So, uh, good afternoon everybody. So it's a pleasure today to present you this uh, webinar on oven construction materials. So first of all, I will present you briefly myself. So I'm Antonin Fabry. I'm a researcher at NTP in France in the Laborate LTDS and I work on oven material since about a dozen of years. And I co-chair with Chris Beckett the Realm Technical Committee characterization of the mechanical performance and durability of oven material and structures. So, my presentation will be divided into three main parts. In the first part, will be dedicated to the definition of what is earth, what is oven construction, and what is earth material. The second one will be focused on the mechanical behavior of the material and its coupling with its water content. And last but not least, uh, the last part will be the crucial uh, durability issue of the material. So, um, I will begin with uh, the question of definition of what is uh, earth and what is oven material. Now, if we follow the definition given by the French National Project on Earth Construction, so uh, raw earth should be a natural material from a soil or subsoil, use raw, for the construction and the renovation of buildings and whose cohesion is mainly ensured by the presence of clays. So, the last part of this sentence there is very important because uh, it means that if you use a non gravity soil and you put some additive on this soil in order to make it suitable for construction, this new material will not be raw earth, it will be something else. In uh, raw earth, in earth, the binder between the aggregates must be uh, inserted by the clay matrix. So, now the question is, um, does this definition is sufficient in order to define a material which is uh, proper for construction? And the problem is that no, this definition is not sufficient because the type of soil which is acceptable for a construction will strongly depend on the construction techniques. Some soils will be okay for all construction techniques, while some other soil will be only uh, valid for some construction techniques. And some other soil will be valid for no construction techniques. And another the problem is that there is a lot of construction techniques. So I will not have the time to detail all of them, but what we can see is that uh, there is some differences in the uh, water content of fabrication of the, of the earth. There will be some differences in the implementation methods. There will be some differences in the compaction method, etc., etc. So, in order to illustrate that point, I will present uh, here today four uh, main construction techniques. We have the four main load bearing construction techniques actually, uh, which are rammed earth, uh, um, compacted earth blocks, um, cob, and adobe. So, for rammed earth, so you take the earth, you put the earth at its optimal water content, which is basically the optimal proctor water content, and um, you put this earth on a formwork and you can uh, compact the earth with a ram. At the end, you remove a formwork and you have a monolithic wall. For compact earth blocks, it, the um, water content of the uh, earth is the same, but the compaction is made within a press to make some bricks, and after that, that the bricks will be implemented with mortar to make a masonry wall. If you take some cob, here the earth is uh, at a plastic state, so at a much more liquid state uh, when, uh, of, um, when it is manufactured. Uh, for example, the water manufactured water content of cob is about 20 to 30 percent, while the manufactured water content for round earth and CEB is over between 8 percent and 12 percent. So, uh, for cob, so we take the plastic earth mix mixture, which is composed by earth shore, but most of the time with uh, fibers like straw, for example, and uh, you can make monolithic wall by la layering. And um, at the end, uh, there is adobe. So, in adobe, the earth uh, is approximately at the same state as cob, so plastic state, but it is put into a, into a frame to make some bricks. And after that, the bricks will be uh, implemented with mortar to make some masonry wall, like CEB. So, uh, what we can uh, see uh, there is that um, these construction techniques are very different. And uh, the picture is even more complex because um, each craftsman can uh, develop his own construction techniques in order to adapt to the particularity of wine soil or because of his know-how which uh, lead to a kind of variation of these methods. And so it's very complex uh, given the strong difference between methods to define what will be a suitable soil for urban construction because the suitable soil will depend on the construction techniques and the construction techniques are, are contest. So one option may be to um, 
uh, impose some kind of construction technique to make a standardization of the construction techniques. But this approach will not be uh, good. It will be counterproductive. Why? Because it will uh, prevent the craftsman to adapt itself to the soil which is on, uh, on site. So, right now, the best option to be sure that a soil is suitable for construction or not is to follow a performantial approach. So this approach consists in make some control samples and to test them. If the control sa sample um, give uh, the great threshold values, it's okay. If not, it's not okay. One other point I want to underline is that um, oven construction are well, uh, are well distributed all over the world. And uh, there is a lot of uh, people that live in oven construction. For example, in a study from Marsh and Hall in 2021, uh, it is shown that about 10% of the world's population lived in oven dwellings, which is far from negligible. And uh, apart from this um, uh, quantification aspect, we can see that uh, oven construction uh, earth has led to very uh, interesting architecture and very interesting uh, cultural heritage building, like the Buddha Mosque of Guinea, the Simbab city of Yemen. And what's more, earth is not a material from the past, because uh, uh, right now a lot of architects and masons continue to be inspired by oven construction to make um, buildings with a very good character. For example, we can see uh, there there is the uh, Orangerie in Lyon, uh, which is a, which is a, a building with a, with an arch in a round earth, and there is a, the Maison pour tous uh, in uh, in Four near Lyon as well, which was made by Tim Arsen, which is a very interesting uh, building. But uh, if I ask to the audience now, uh, what do you think about oven construction? What do you have in mind when I say to you uh, what is oven construction? Most of you will have some kind of picture like this one in, uh, in mind, uh, which is picture of disease, of collapse, of problem. And the question is why we have this picture in mind when we talk about oven construction? Is of material the problem? Uh, actually, as for me, no. Because as any construction material, oven material can lead to durable construction. We can see from the cultural heritage. But for that purpose, we need to clearly understand the behavior of this material in order to have a building which are properly designed, in order to have a material which is properly implemented, in order to have maintenance and reliability assurance operation which are made correctly. And so for that purpose, to know uh, the material is to know its limits and to know what we can do with the material and what we can not do with this material. And um, in order to make, actually, some suitable regulation for this material and suitable regulation for its implementation and, and for its maintenance. So now, if we want to look much more in detail, what will be one main uh, difference between uh, oven materials and other construction materials. So there is plenty of difference, but one main difference is the fact that uh, oven material behavior will strongly depend on its water content. And it will be uh, the second part of my presentation, it will be the impact of this water content on the mechanical behavior of the matter. So to illustrate that point, I'll present here um, an experimental campaign we have made at UNTPE on a numerous uh, round of uh, sample at several water content. And we can see in this graph that there is a drop of strength of the material when the water content increases. That's why when uh, oven walls are put to a too high water content, we can, uh, we can have some collapse of the walls. But this um, uh, this fact is not new because it is well known in geotechnical operation that the load bearing capacity of soil decreases with water content. And this point is taken into account in most of uh, elastoplastic uh, models for unsaturated soil with a loading collapse curve, for example. Uh, and so this point, since it is well known, it can be avoided by uh, a proper design of, uh, of, uh, of the buildings, so by preventing liquid water to go through the, uh, the oven walls. But um, what is important as well is that we need to know that Earth is an hygroscopic material. So by hygroscopic material, I mean that you have high uh, water adsorption properties and you have high uh, permeability to vapor. The consequence of that is that when the air uh, relative humidity will change, the water content within the material will change as well. 
So this um, particularity can give some great assets to oven uh, construction. It's uh, the fact that it leads to a good uh, moisture buffering capacity of oven construction and it leads to good agrothermal property. But the counterpart of that is that if water content varies, maybe the mechanical behavior of the material might vary with uh, the variation of relative humidity in the air. So to um, measure the variation of water content within the material, material in function of relative humidity of the air, we can make the uh, isotherm uh, sorption isotherms. So it consists in put samples at, uh, within airs at increasing relative humidity and then to uh, within air at decreasing relative humidity to have either the adsorption or the desorption curves. And uh, for the material tested here, we can see that if the air relative humidity varies between 20% and 80%, the water content varies approximately between 0.5% uh, and 2%. And with it, this, this range of water content, we can see in this graph that it seems to have a quite a significant variation of mechanical strength. However, here, the results are quite scattered, so we need to go much more in detail to analyze this point. And uh, this uh, detailed analysis was made with a triaxial cell at control uh, temperature and humidity. So it consists of a quite common triaxial cell, but uh, in this one, the air within the cell is controlled by a uh, wet air generator at, uh, at uh, uh, controlled relative humidity. And um, for that test, we have, uh, for that campaign, we have tested uh, three kinds of, of mixture, the one which is a raw earth, and for the two other one, it's a mix between this raw earth and sand in order to reduce the clay content and to see the impact of clay content of the material on its um, uh, variation of mechanical behavior with water content. So for this free uh, mix of uh, earth, so the, the raw one with 35% uh, of clay content, the second one with 26% uh, of clay content, and the last one of 70% uh, uh, of uh, clay content, we have made the adsorption curves. And what we can see is that the higher the clay content is, the higher the, um, the water content will be at a given relative humidity. Uh, but what is interesting is that if we normalize this isotherm curve with the clay content, we can see that all the curves remain approximately the same. So we can see that most of the water which come within the material due to the uh, air relative humidity go in the clay content of the material. So and after that, what we have made some tests at we made some tests at uh, one, uh, uh, one temperature, which is a 23 degree, uh, and free confinement pressure, zero bar, one bar, and six bar of uh, confinement pressure. And we have tests at free relative humidity, which are 23%, uh, 75%, and 98%. So if we use the Kelvin law that depicted the, the chemical equilibrium between uh, adsorbed water and uh, the water vapor, we can calculate through, um, with this relativity the suction of the material. So uh, basically, what is the suction? The suction is the, is the opposite of the um, thermodynamical pressure of the adsorbed water. So the higher the suction is, the higher the interaction will be between water and the solid matrix. So, and what we can say that is that suction values are very high. So they are uh, strongly higher than values which are commonly observed in geotechnical operations. So, and these are the results we have obtained. So, um, first of all, we can see that the behavior is quite complex, is nonlinear, and the behavior will depend on the clay content. So we can see um, a strong variation of, uh, of behavior of material in function of the uh, of if we have a limb mixed to a mi of mix one uh, material. The second thing we can observe is that there is a strong variation with uh, relative humidity. For example, if we take the limb samples there, uh, at 98% uh, uh, of relative humidity, the strength of the material is about 4%. For uh, MPA, sorry. But uh, if we put at um, uh, the material at 23% of relative humidity, we can see that the strength is about 8 megapascal. So uh, there is a drop uh, by 2 of the strength when the relative humidity go from 23% of relative humidity to 98% uh, of relative humidity. And this effect of relative humidity is less important when the clay content decreases. Uh, the second point we can see is when we make some uh, unloading-loading uh, 
uh, unloading loading uh, cycles, uh, it remains a residual strain within the material. So that depicted some kind of plasticity within the material. And uh, as well, this unloading loading uh, curves, there is no hysteresis loop at low stress level, but when we go to high stress level, we can see an hysteresis loop. Another point which is interesting is the volumetric behavior there. Well, we can see that there is first contractancy within the material, which is followed by uh, dilatancy. So it's a quite complex uh, mechanical behavior, and this, uh, this volumetric behavior will depend on the relative humidity as well and of the clay, and of the clay contents. And now if we look much more in detail of the, of the loops, with these loops we can uh, reach the uh, elastic parameter of the material, and in particular the Young modulus. And we can see that uh, the Young modulus tends to decrease with the stress level. And this kind of behavior is commonly observed when we have damage. So all these points show that uh, our, mater our material is uh, non-linear. Uh, uh, there will be plastic behavior, that will be damage, and there will be complex volumetric behavior. So all these points uh, need to, take to be taken into account in a model if we want to have a, a precise, precise uh, behavior of a material. To go further on that point, uh, we have made an additional test in order to, um, to analyze the swelling and shrinkage of the material when the relative humidity varies. For that purpose, we take the same two axial cells, but instead of keeping the relative humidity constant, we make a variation of relative humidity between 5%, which is the lowest value possible, up to 90%, which is the highest uh, value of relative humidity. And uh, what you saw here is that the value of uh, strain, so it is the axial strain here of, of the material, uh, due, um, due to the relative humidity variation, are low, but are not negligible. The order of magnitude of this strain for 1% variation of the relative humidity is similar to the strain uh, observed for uh, one variation of 1 degree, so for the thermal dilatation or thermal contraction for, uh, due to 1 degree of variation of temperature. So uh, even if these values are not so important, maybe they should be taken into account if we want to properly model the material. To finish on that, uh, on that mechanical uh, behavior, we can see that the behavior of the material is very complex, very strong couplings between mechanical behavior and uh, relative humidity and relative humidity. And maybe uh, there is plastic handling, there is stiffness degradation, so there is uh, most, very strongly damage, contraction direction of our vol volumic behavior, etc. Et so now what we need to do is to um, quantify much more in detail the importance of all these phenomena on the behavior of, of an one, uh, one construction to see which of these phenomena need to be taken into account for a proper design and which can be simplified and which can be uh, neglected. And it is very important if we want to build um, a design code for urban construction because it will not be possible to take all the complexity, but it will not be possible as well to take no complexity of this material. Okay, so the last part of my presentation will deal with durability, which is an important part for urban constructions. So when we talk about um, durability problems, the first thing to do is to see from uh, on-site observation. And uh, for that purpose, so in France, there is two uh, books, so, which are in French for sure, but which are very interesting. The first one is the Good Practice Guide, which is, was written by almost all the professional oven construction in France and which give a very good feedback of uh, durability and of what should be made in order to increase the durability of oven construction. And the second one is a notebook, expertise notebook, uh, written by Pascal Scarato and uh, Jackie Janet, uh, which are two architects. And it is very interesting because they share their experience for round of construction. And it is, um, these two books are very interesting and if you can read French, I, uh, I uh, recommend them. So now, uh, on the basis of this book and on the several discussions we have with craftsmen and with, uh, with people living in other construction, we can say that the main durability problem is due to uh, problem of backfilling, uh, uh, ironing of uh, and adjunct rock, uh, rock uh, near an earthen walls. So due to that, at the beginning, the earthen wall will be protected by the basement. But if there is this kind of job technical operation, the earthen wall will no more be protected by the basement. And so there can be water infiltration. And if there is water infiltration, there will be collapse. So it is the main cause, actually, of, uh, of pathology. So it's not due to the 
often building by itself, but it's due to external operations. The second one, which is much more due to the building itself, will be some uh, rising dump, for example, will be some inf infiltration of water due to uh, leakage, for example, for some kind of, uh, of hydraulic network within the houses, of some, some infiltration from the roof, etc. Et so um, this second one is actually a maintenance problem. So maintenance of the basement, basement of the network within the houses, or within the house, or uh, maintenance of the roof. Another one, which is um, quite uh, quite um, uh, oftenly uh, found, is uh, surface erosion and surface abrasion. So this one is not a very harmful uh, problem because it's mainly visual, but uh, but uh, it's a problem which is um, commonly encountered, and which and so due to that, sometimes we need to uh, make the oven plaster quite uh, quite often. Um, another one, it is when there is some modification of the uh, houses, for example, a modification of the uh, of the roof and uh, by a ter terrace, for example. And so, or if there is work in progress on the roof, or there is construction with a succession of floor uh, slab against the oven wall, etc., etc. All of these things uh, will can lead to uh, an income of water, supply of water within the oven wall, and so it will lead to collapse. And after that, there is the external effect. Uh, of external effect like uh, fire attacks, so fire resistance, uh, freezing growing resistance, and surely because, and particularly nowadays we know that, the problem of earthquake and seismic resistance. So, among all these problems, what I want to, um, to deal with but more in detail uh, there is the uh, freezing growing resistance. Uh, why? Because this um, uh, this problem has been highlighted by uh, by uh, Scarato and Janet to be one important problem, but we do not know why, because uh, because we don't know why a freezing growing phenomena can increase the problem of uh, uh, of collapse of a fan wall. So um, for that uh, purpose, we have made um, uh, two studies. The first one uh, consists in making some cycle of uh, freezing growing of samples with, with no supply of water. And the first study showed that there will be no problem of uh, damage. So we made a second study. In the second study, uh, we make freezing growing of water, but with water supply. The freezing freezing growing of, of um, samples sorry, with a supply of water. And the supply of water uh, was made within two approaches. The first approach is, uh, consists in putting the sample in contact with liquid water. So there, is, there will be rising dump within the sample. And the second one consists in putting the sample in a chamber of relative humidity at 100% during the following stage. And the sample uh, will be uh, submitted to freezing daily uh, freezing growing cycle, cycle. So it will be freezing at uh, minus 23 degrees during 24 hours during one day and growing at 23 degrees du du during uh, 24 uh, hour, hours, hours as well. And we have compared what's happened with the samples we need to freezing growing cycle to reference samples. So for the reference samples, it will be exactly the same condition than samples which, which are submitted to freezing growing cycle, but at the difference, there will not be the freezing stage. So during the freezing stage, there will be uh, ever stored in a um, in a relative humidity uh, room at uh, 23 degrees or uh, or, um, or isolated in a room at 23 degrees. And these are the results we obtain. So in um, in um, uh, orange and in uh, gray, we have uh, we have a reference samples. So the samples we, which are not submitted to freezing growing cycles. While in uh, while in uh, blue and green, we have the sample which are submitted to freezing growing cycles. And what we can see is that while the samples reference samples um, doesn't collapse, the sample submitted to freezing for example collapse quite rapidly. And the amount of water within the sample increases much more rapidly than uh, the other samples. So we can wonder why there is this phenomenon. So to analyze that, we can say that, okay, during the vowing, uh, what happened during the vowing? During the vowing, the sample begin to vow first from its edge, while, while the core of the sample will remain frozen. 
and uh, because the water at the vicinity with the ice crystal will be in depression due to the interfacial action between the ice crystal and the water, what will have it will, will have a kind of cryosuction. So the water at the edge of the sample will want to go uh, in the core of the sample. And because there is water supply, so there will be water supply uh, within the sample. And we will start and we will not be there will not be the opposite during the bowing because during the bowing uh, uh, during the freezing sorry because during the freezing the sample will begin to freeze by the external surfaces and these external surfaces will make the material waterproof. And so um, we can understand uh, here why there is uh, such kind of uh, of behavior and why freezing rain cycle can increase can increase the risk of collapse of walls. But what to learn from this experiment? What we have to learn is that, okay, so freezing rain cycle can be harmful, but the physical mechanism that lead to this uh, harmful effect is very different from the one which is involved for, for example, freezing rain durability of concrete. So if we want to test the durability of the material within freezing rain behavior, we need to, to um, develop new tests and not to use the test for concrete because the tests for concrete are not designed for the proper phenomenon. So that's why it is very important to understand the, what's happened, the physical phenomena, what's happened uh, in order to build the proper test and not to use the test that exists from other construction techniques that might not be appropriate. So um, as we seen uh, up to now, uh, we can see that uh, water seems to be the main problem of durability of oven construction. So how to reduce this uh, sensibility to water. So uh, one way to reduce this is to, to, is to make earth stabilization of earth biostabilization. And the uh, more common way to do that is to put cement on lime or lime on earth. So uh, that was what we have made in a PhD study, um, thesis uh, at NTP. And what we have seen is that, okay, sure, that sta uh, cement stabilization can increase the resistance to water. Here, we have made a test of erosion, and we can see that for one earth, for example, F1 here, which is a quite basic uh, earth with a low organic content, we can see that stabilization is very good. While for other earth, for example, much more acid earth or earth with uh, higher organic content, we can see that the stabilization is not so efficient. But on the opposite, even if the stabilization is not efficient, the fact of adding cement in earth will uh, strongly reduce its uh, um, agrothermal property. So it will be a drawback and will strongly increase its, its economical impact. So, yeah. We have to take that in uh, in uh, in mind. Um, so um, biostabilization have uh, have been recently developed. So the the idea is to not use cement but use some uh, some uh, additive which are uh, much more eco friendly. But even with this biostabilization, there is the problem of reversibility of the material. There is the problem of uh, of ecological impact because we had something in the material, and even with that, we can see that some sometimes it is efficient and sometimes it is not efficient. So much more research I needed on that point to be able to draw some definitive conclusion. And we have tested another, another way to reduce the, the erosion of a plaster and the impact of water on the erosion of a plaster is the surface texturation. And what we have made, we have tested some several uh, oven plaster but with several surface rugosity. And uh, the results obtained are presented there, so we can see a, a, a droplet which is dropped in the, in the plasters, and we can see that in function of the rugosity, the time uh, uh, required for the droplet to penetrate within the material will be different. The smoother the, the surface will be, the longer will be the, the penetration of the droplet within the material. This uh, point was also analyzed with uh, with X-ray microtomograph, and we can see that with a smoother smoother surface, the droplet penetration will be less important uh, than uh, with uh, with a more rigorous uh, surface. So, sure, this uh, this analysis is at the beginning, but it can um, it can be a path of research to say if we can make so kind of texturation on oven material in order to increase their durability to water. So um, to conclude my presentation, we can see that there is a lot of remaining challenge for oven construction. And 
most of this remaining sh challenge will be treated within the redem technical committees and uh, because there is three technical committees there is one which is most focused on the first part of my presentation on the uh, processing of, of best, best material uh, second one, which is the one uh, so uh, that we uh, lead with Chris, Chris Baker and me, is much more uh, related to the second part of this presentation, which is how to assess the performance and as well of the durability of the uh, of oven construction. And the last one uh, uh, will be much more focused on uh, biostabilization and stabilization of the material. And so. Um, uh, it is very important to, to, to view all these three systems uh, together because we can see that it's a, it's, a complex, uh, it's a complex system. In France, as well, we have a kind of network that has been created, is the National Project uh, PNTER, uh, Avant National Project, and um, we stand to put together the practitioner of the earth and the researcher. And uh, what is important, if you are interested in about construction, is that the next general meeting we we'll have on uh, uh, our construction will be uh, at the uh, end of November and, be and beginning of December in Paris uh, at University Gustave Eiffel. And so, um, do not.